Hi, everyone. Welcome to Vern Goes Against the Grain. I'm your host, Eric Vernston. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is an amazing episode. I'm so excited you can be here. This is a guest that I tried very hard to get, and he is so busy. And when you check out his website and all the prolific amounts of writing he does, you are going to be like, wow, I can't believe this guy had any time for you, which is why I thank Dr. Joshua Gans so much for his time. We had a wonderful 30-minute conversation. I want to give you a little bit of Dr. Gans's bio. Joshua Gans is a professor of, strate- professor of strategic management and holder of the Jeffrey S. Skoll Chair of Technical Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Rotman School of Management, University of Toronto, with a cross appointment in the Department of Economics. Joshua is also Chief Economist at the University of Toronto's Creative Destruction Lab. Prior to 2011, he was the Foundation Professor of Management, in parentheses, Information Economics, at the Melbourne Business School, University of Melbourne. And prior to that, he was at the School of Economics, University of New South Wales. Dr. Joshua Gans is amazing. He's written over 10 books, and the way I found him is most recently here, he's writing a newsletter called Plugging the Gap, Economics, Technology, Entrepreneurship, and a Recent COVID-19 Obsession. I love his newsletter. It is addicting. He brings such an interesting perspective as in, uh, from the economics background that you just don't get anywhere else. And it's just a really, he talks about all different aspects of COVID. I love the newsletter. He's written two books too. I told you he's prolific. He's written 10 overall. He also wrote a book about economics and parenting, which we do cover in the podcast. So in the last, say last five minutes of this 25 minute podcast, if you want to hear about uh, economics and parenting, that's the part for you. We covered everything in literally 20 minutes. We talked about how he evaluates uh, situations, how he looked at the be- how he even got started in this, like what was fascinating to him, which I really liked, especially how he described like why he even got into looking at this specific, like why I look at COVID and economics. We talked about lessons to be learned. We talked about what happened even, uh, he gave me a great history lesson about the Spanish flu and what we can take away from there. We talked about what it means to be this, for COVID to be an endemic. There were also tons of positive moments of hope, Dr. Gans outlined with information. It wasn't just swinging from the fence. He's a fantastic individual. I highly recommend subscribe to his newsletter. Check out his website, www.joshua, J-O-S-H-U-A, Gans, G-A-N-S.com. Take a look at all of his books. I'm especially going to buy the book on parenting. I have a child coming, so I definitely need that one. This interview was so good. Whether you're interested in COVID or just want to find out how economics works and how an economist thinks, that is a wonderful skill to add to your skill stack. And it's one of the reasons I'm so happy he came on because I want to learn from him. I want to learn from the best. And Dr. Joshua Gans is the best. I want to plug a couple of things quickly before we get to interview. One, I wrote a book. Did you know that? You probably did because I talked about it a million times. 10 Scientifically Proven Ways Steve Jobs Went Against the Grain, available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Also, Dr. Gans's books, I believe, are also available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. You can check those out on his website, again, www.joshuagans.com. Finally, I am accepting tips. I know it's fun to do everything for free, but if you enjoy the podcast and maybe there's something you want to see have done, I might have an offering where if you want me to give you a shout out to something, maybe it was a graduation, you know, like an old baseball game thing, who knows? But if you go to anchor.com slash Vern goes ATG, I believe that's the website. I hope it is. You can find a tips page. I accept tips. We'll do some other things like that. If you do, thank you so much. If not, hey, I'm going to keep producing awesome content because I love helping people. And that's the reason I asked uh, Dr. Gans to come on because he is helping so many people and he is absolutely amazing. With that being said, I want to get to Dr. Gans in his interview because we had a wonderful time. He was fantastic. Please check out his work and please enjoy this 25 minute interview with Dr. Joshua Gans on COVID and economics. Dr. Joshua Gans, welcome to Vern Goes Against Grain podcast. So good to meet you. Hey, good to meet you too. First question for you. You are 
an accomplished economist. You're a professor. You've written numerous books. I believe I counted at least 10. Now you're switching gears. You're focusing specifically on the economic impacts of COVID. You've got this newsletter. You've written at least two books on the subject. I think one book is free, so you're not doing this for the money. Why are you doing this? Well, basically, um, uh, March last year, I was spending all my time refreshing statistics on infections. And after a week of doing that, I, I kind of lost my mind and decided, uh, uh, what can I actually do that's close to, you know, what I sat down and thought, what am I good at? that I can combine with refreshing screens on COVID <laughs> statistics. And uh, I decided, well, I'm good at writing books. So I would write a book trying to explain all of the economic issues that were flying at us from the pandemic. Um, I didn't have any particular background in uh, those sort, that sort of area of economics, uh, but the, the issues were quite general. Uh, and so, I used it as an opportunity to make sense of it myself and to hopefully explain it to others. Um, and I never stopped. What was it about when you started really digging in and started writing, what was it about the topic that you found so interesting that you have been so prolific? I mean, that's the reason I found you actually is from, I, I stumbled onto your newsletter and I read them all the time. They're fantastic. Well, I, I was really interested uh, and partly because we were living this as well in how difficult it is to make these decisions in a, in a crisis. You had like this ticking time bomb that was going. Uh, it looked, you know, if you applied some mathematics to it early, it looked like it was gonna be really, really bad. Um, and it, it, it turned out to be. Um, yet you saw all of these people trying to make decisions on this, you know, of how to, to react to, you know, whether to shut things down and, and stuff like that. Uh, and you had experiences uh, and information trickling in from around the world. First there was China and then there was the, that cruise ship and then there was Italy and, and, and so on. And I really thought it was, you know, how do you make those decisions? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, there was a, a tendency for, at the time, most people were either, the majority of people were, oh, this is nothing, uh, you know, this is, I can't see it, so it's not there. Um, uh, then there were people who were freaking out uh, as well, uh, and they turned out to be the correct ones. Um, and there are people such as myself who listened to the people freaking out, uh, waited a bit, and then started to freak out myself um, <laughs> at that time. So, and I, I kind of knew it was like, there was just so much we didn't know and uh, no decision was a good one. And I thought that that was interesting. And, you know, that's happened throughout this. Uh, basically people having to work out what to do, subtle issues of timing, meaning big effects. Uh, it's really, really uh, uh, a, a horrible problem. And I think that's what fascinated me the most. When you, when you go through, so you're very, you're, you seem like a very introspective person. You've talked about in your blog how you've made some really good decisions. And then you've also looked back on some of the ones that you made that you were, you were incorrect on. Right. When you look at just the, the globe as a whole, do you think it's such a complex problem where we really shouldn't blame anyone for some of those early decisions? Or are there certain places or certain actors that you're like, you know what, their decision making based on even what the data was saying was just, you know, was flawed? Like, how do you, I guess, how do you, do you evaluate people like that? How do you think about that? Well, I think, I mean, I wax and wane on this issue, um, you know, obviously for, for, you know, there are different levels of issues that we've faced. Uh, and, uh, you know, while sometimes you can understand when people take the wrong path and, and things like that, I mean, I had, you know, last summer when the uh, case numbers started to fall because of seasonal factors, uh, people were sort of like, oh, it's all over. And then I was yeah. like listening to people saying, it doesn't look like it's over. And it was very interesting to see, you know, smart, intelligent people who were taking it seriously also deciding, oh, now we're done. Um, and so, it's the, you know, emotions and hope and other things play in all of that. But, but you know, in my own uh, thing, yeah, no, there were, uh, you know, there were times 
I haven't shied away from making calls. You know, I think this is going to happen. Um, partly because uh, I think it's, you know, it, you know, it, you know, I think some of those things were things that weren't being weighed in enough. So right at the, the very first thing I wrote about the pandemic was I could not understand when you looked at the mathematics in all sorts of places and you, and the, and you looked at hospital capacity and you're going to ram into that in a month's time. And I couldn't understand why, you know, the military wasn't mobilized building out <laughs> hospital yeah. beds and things like that and so you know at that time that's what I said basically you know this is war and we have to treat it like war and I, I called that um, so that that was a reasonable one although interestingly enough it turned out that people got the message and we never really hit those limits in the way people were suggesting some places yes but but certainly not here in in, in Ontario um, and there were other issues where, you know, when I was, you know, doing all this initially, writing an entire book in March and April last year, you know, I had to guess what the issues were going to be. And the big one I saw coming was, if we ever get a vaccine, we weren't going to have enough of it, <laughs> you know, because that's just how these things are. Sure. Um, and I thought that that would be a more terrible and painful issue uh, in the sense of people misbehaving because of a shortage of something that is potentially life saving. And, uh, you know, because uh, and I, I must admit, I was swayed by Hollywood on that, because every one of these movies comes in, sure. and pandemic, yeah. the vaccine comes in, and then there's a fight over, over getting stuff. Uh, and, and people, and to my, uh, you know, my defense, people were fighting over toilet paper. So, you know, it's not like the. They it might, might be back here again. We're we're having some supply yeah. chain issues. So <laughs> who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, right. Uh, the strategic toilet paper stockpile. But you know the the but but really when you when you look at it is yes there's you know uh, some you know I would like the vaccine quicker and stuff like that, but it's been pretty calm and civilized as these things go. Uh, you know, the, the misbehavior has been low. And not only that, is I thought we'd have to pick some very, very rigid, you know, age-based rule or some sort of lottery so that everybody formed the queue and were very orderly. Sure. And we haven't done that. No one's done that. Yeah. No one's done that at all. And in fact, I mean, when there's been shortages, people have sort of prioritized different things. Like, you know, here in, in Toronto, if you live in one postcode, you can get the vaccine 18 or plus and the adjacent one, not, at, you know, you have to be 50 plus um, yeah. because one's a hotspot and the other isn't. Yeah. And that hasn't caused issues. Um, so I, I thought, I thought that that was, you know, you know, in terms of things that I thought were going to be amazing. Like the hunger problem, games you know, going for the uh, yeah, vaccine. I was, no, I was jumping up and down saying, you need to have a plan for all this. And I was always looking for the plan for it, but I think it turned out people were okay. Now, if this was all more lethal, and, and I think this, and I think when it comes to treatments, you know, like we see the scramble over oxygen and stuff like that, it gets very urgent. The vaccines, not so much. Vaccines, people are like, I can deal. <laughs> when you are going through, and I'm assuming you work with a lot of, you, you probably connected, you probably connected with people, people across the globe during this, people found your yeah. writing, other other experts in the field for someone like me, or I always use the example of my mom. My mom's very, she's a wonderful woman, but she's like, we'll give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, she was like, Hey, should I start buying the Bitcoin? You know, it's like that. How, if you're someone like that, how, do, how would you recommend they go about trying to figure out who to, who to follow in, in sifting through information? Yeah, no, that's really quite difficult. Uh, I think one of the things that we will look one of the things that we weren't prepared for is how to message properly. I mean, everybody knew that was a big issue. Um, you, you heard Obama at the beginning talking about how he thought the pandemics were, you know, that was a, a serious issue. And he learned from 2009 that the most important thing was to let the scientists speak mm -hmm. and have a consistent message. Now, the, the problem with that is the scientists did a lot of second guessing. And I've already said, you know, I applied economics and I, you know, for a shortage issue, I got that wrong. Um, and 
The reason is, is that messaging is not just, just because you happen to be a, a, a noted immunologist or something like that, or a virologist or an epidemiologist, doesn't mean you know how to message things to the public. Uh, and, you know, I guess my bias is that they could have done more nuanced messaging. And I think the the initial mask issue highlighted that. Sure, they, were very, sure. they saw the people running for the toilet paper and they said, I don't want everybody grabbing all the masks because we need it for the medical mm -hmm. things. Yep. So they told people masks weren't necessary. Now, the problem with that was they were. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or they were going to change the money. They could have been necessary. Sure. And so, you know, there was a different, more nuanced message that could have been done there, uh, maybe backed up with a bit of, uh, uh, enforcement as well. So we, we, you can't get the N95s, they're for the doctors, but we do encourage you to get X, Y, and Z. Um, and so, so I, think, I think that could have been done. And now we've sort of flipped the other way. We're very, very extreme on masks. Yep. And, you know, when it comes down to it, I think, uh, you know, that's fine. That's a good precautionary thing to do. Um, but it's not clear that they are as valuable as people make out to be. Um, you know, people have got infected in workplaces where they've been wearing masks. Uh, you wear masks all day, it's a whole different thing. And some of the things they worried about initially, such as when you wear a mask, you got to fit it properly, et cetera, you know, probably matter. <laughs> you, know, you, you see the people, they're, the walk, they're like, oh, I have a mask on, but it only comes yeah, blown. Yeah. The, I know, yeah. exactly. Uh, yeah. I mean, but effective messaging there, you saw this great, there was this thing on the thing and said, well, what if you did that with your with pants and were too low <laughs> that's what you look like and yeah you can get so there were ways to do that but you know i never saw i don't think there is a person or set of people on a on those teams who are understand messaging and debate it and really worked it out i think there was things uh you know here's what we can tell them here's what we can't tell them no assumptions made and I think that is, that proves out to be very diff diff difficult. So in terms of just anybody trying to uh, understand this is, is uh, it, you know, it is a fraught thing. Um, you know, I think in, it, it, what this really means is we don't, it's going to be a mess whenever we let the pandemic become a pandemic, yep. uh, when it goes and spreads. Uh, we, we, uh, all of the real mistakes were letting it happen to this level. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's the thing we have to avoid because I don't think there's an easy solution after that point. It's painful regardless. So now going off that, we're, we're past that. We're well past that point. Oh yeah. In, oh yeah. For what over almost a year and probably two, almost a year and a quarter. Right. So you've said, and I am a paraphrase this. So let me know if I'm wrong, but this will eventually become an endemic. Where essentially like a, almost like a seasonal, maybe not seasonal, but it, it's something we're going to have to deal with. So yes. what for those out there that like what is an endemic and then what kind of economic consequences you see going forward, maybe in the short term right. of that? So in 1918, 1920, we had this other pandemic, which, you know, ended up being uh, far, far worse, uh, even in a less connected world. Uh, and the result of that that pandemic um, was, uh, you know, seasonal flus that come and go, <laughs> and, and, you know, and different strains of it. And we get it all the way up through now. Um, and that's what happens when a respiratory virus uh, extends through the population and can circulate and can circulate between hemispheres. It's more of a migration that occurs because it never gets stamped out anywhere. Yeah. Um, so uh, what that means is it'll crop up again. It, it won't be as bad because most of us will be mostly immune to it. So it won't spread as much. But, you know, some of the every other one of these things has had what's called waning immunity, uh, especially in the older population. Uh, and so it tends to come around. Um, and so this is just a thing that isn't going away. Now, we'll learn to live with that. The real tragedy at the moment is that there are whole of, the countries that have gone for zero COVID, Australia and New Zealand being top of that list. Well, they've got a real problem with an endemic 
thing in the world. <laughs> and this actually happened to Australia last time. Last time Australia, in 1918, Australia managed to keep that virus out, but eventually two years later had to let, you know, had people coming and sure. going and yeah. it ripped through that country, oh. ripped through the country. And it's something I remember from my childhood, as you know, Australia and New Zealand lost 900,000 people. There were not that many people there <laughs> in, in that. So I, 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 I fear that's, that's sadly going to happen together, and, and I don't think they've quite woken up to it. <laughs> and so, so this, is, this is what we, we, we are going to live with now in the world. Um, I, I, as I said, I think it'll be background noise for the most part once we're over this, but it might take a while, a few years before we get to that stage. Do you see any other, like, for example, like global economic consequences? I'm not saying like investment advice, but do you think, right. like, do you think there'll be issues with tourism opening up or is like, like oh, what yeah. do you see any other, yeah, like any industries maybe not coming back or maybe some new industries coming from this? Like, how do you, or do you think yeah. about it completely differently? I mean, I think there's sort of two sorts of, there's one set of things that have just been accelerated you know, uh, the thing we're doing now, for instance, yeah. uh, uh, has been accelerated because of COVID. We just ran a whole lot of experiments and a whole lot of things are working better than we expected. And then we're yeah. starting to appreciate the old stuff. And so some of those things will stick. The, the, the biggest impact of the pandemic and why it's such a strange economic impact is it's mainly impacted on labor intensive leisure. Um, so that's going to restaurants, shows, mm -hmm. tourism, all very labor intensive, Yeah, all very optional. <laughs> you know, yeah. you don't need yeah. it in your life. And you certainly don't need it when you've got capital intensive leisure, which we have now, which is basically Netflix and co. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, those things, that's kind of interesting. Now, I think that stuff will come back um it, once people feel confident about it um i know when i still go into a public place now you know having one dose of a vaccine you know i'm still wary of other people this idea of being comfortable i don't know what it would be like to be on a plane i'm that's going to take getting used to it sure um but uh you know that will pass um and those things will then come back because there'll be some pent-up demand for it uh so 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 that will happen uh, but in, in terms of, but it's going to take a while still. I mean, I think it'll be a few years before we get tourism uh, coming back properly. Uh, I think mainly because countries are still going to impose into border border restrictions. Sure. Uh, but but for other things, uh, they'll come back a bit quicker. The local stuff. Do you see any issues with like for right now in the United States? one of the big things people were talking about is inflation. People are, some of the prices of food have went up, gas right. has gone up. I don't know how other countries have done everything, but it's, at least here, you know, we had, a, we've had multiple stimulus and I don't know if that's related totally to it, but do you see inflation or any other monetary policy issues affecting any of the near term or even maybe longer term? So I'm not a macroeconomist. <laughs> I find macroeconomics a little bit puzzling. Uh, I must admit, you know, Let's be very clear. The big surprise in the world economy from all of this is that apart from cryptocurrencies, which are their own game, uh, exchange rates have been stable. We've had big deficits being spent elsewhere. We've had, you know, yeah. much both. we've had restrictions. We've got all sorts of stuff going on. And yet, you know, uh, the US dollar is worth the same to the euro to everything else <laughs> as, as it yeah. was before and vice versa. That's true, yeah. So, so, uh, you know, every other finance, you know, big uh, economic uh, eruption, uh, you know, tends to hit those things. Um, so I think there's a lot of resilience there uh, is what that means. I think, you know, we may see some of the consequences of pushing some levers to the limit show up. Uh, but, I, you know, we're still fortunately, you know, a decade into the memory of the previous one. And policymakers are very quick. I mean, uh, you know, while we could, we can look at the um, public health response of being wonky and have all sorts of problems that led to this, but I'll tell you, the macroeconomic policy response was clear, mm -hmm. consensus, yep. immediate, yeah, unprecedented. 
clearly prevented all manner of crap that could have otherwise occurred. Sure. Um, and, you know, yeah, to be sure, you can't do much about empl- unemployment when everybody's sitting at home. It's, it's going to have it. And you can't yeah. ha- expect it to bounce all the way back when you don't have in- labor intensive <laughs> leisure going on. Uh, but, but, you know, there, it, was, it was very, very uh, clear. And what's also surprising is there was no economic playbook for this. None. There's no paper written. Here's what you do in the case of a pandemic. I yeah. know because I looked at it because I wanted to. <laughs> um, yeah. But there was huge consensus, which is just like, that's, that's a whole other story that I'm looking forward to somebody on the inside telling. Yeah. Because it happened everywhere. Everybody yeah. had some sort of stimulus. Everybody had much the same sorts of things. Everybody knew that it was going to lead to some odd stuff, but it's okay. <laughs> so, you know what? Hey, that... Let's let's end the pandemic questions on that. That's a that's a sign of hope, right? I mean, I've had yeah. a lot of people. That's fantastic. I'll get you out of here on this one. You and I didn't even realize this, but you wrote a whole book on I believe it's called Parentonomics. Did yes. I get that right? Yes, that's right. You've got at least two kids. Three now. Three. Three now. I've had three for sixteen years. So yeah, three. <laughs> third is sixteen years old. Fantastic. You you talk you told a story in one of your newsletters a couple maybe a couple months ago about how you were using incentives to try to get your your daughter to actually help your son potty train, but kind of backfired. Right. Would you be able to tell either that story, or like maybe, you know, a story that you've, something that maybe you've learned along the way. A lot of my friends, I'm 34, I've got a child coming. A lot of my friends have younger kids. Like what's maybe a good economic tip or two that you've learned that can help them with, with their younger kids? So um, I've learned that, I mean, parents use all the time carrots and sticks to try and get behavior that they want uh and you know a big theme of the book and carrots and sticks is what i'm supposed to know about because i'm an economist (laughs) and so a big uh theme of the the book was you know how well do you how should you think about these things and what are the problems you find and the problems are enormous the problems are enormous so you know with toilet training we tried to get some incentives you know you can have some candy or something like that uh and and you know we got good behavior and our first child was you know realized that in order to get candy all she had to do was sit all day on the on the toilet because something would eventually happen now that is very good because that's kind of what you wanted you wanted her to be sitting there and to get the feeling of that but of course then she also worked out that she could uh do a little bit stop come off the toilet get an award go back do it again (laughs) the rest of it very clever um now again a great function a great function but at some point you have to pull the reward (laughs) sure you couldn't have her sitting on the toilet all day just doing this activity um so it has its costs and its uh, its benefits and and it also depends on the child she happened to be a child that would respond to those things when we had a child that wouldn't we had we had to come up with other things to do. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I hope that uh, everyone who listens to that will figure out a way to maybe, I don't, I mean, I guess, what would you do from that? So if you, if you don't want, so if you give them candy every time, they're going to figure that out. Is there a yeah. way around that? I'm trying to figure it out. I feel like. No, no. Yeah. I mean, the figuring out was pretty good. Um, you, you have to get, there's no quick fix here is what I'm saying. Okay. Is, you know, you're going to have to, there's no way to use carrots and sticks to save you time. Okay. <laughs> you can use that but you have to it's not going to save you any time you'll have to still put in the hours okay. to get the result you want okay well sorry everyone i i you know i got <laughs> one of the smartest people i've ever met in my life on the podcast but you're still going to have to parent yeah. i read a whole book about it but you know if you're in that mode the the book can people seem to like it <laughs> find yeah. it useful uh, check out uh, Joshua Gans, J O S H U A G A N S dot com. I believe that's the website. Yes. You got all the books, the blogs uh, uh, on there. Thank you so much for coming on. Anything, uh, anything you have coming up right now, or any books coming out? No, no. Well, I, I'm still doing the work on the uh, pandemic that seems to not go away. I've got a textbook <laughs> I'm writing on entrepreneurship, so that'll be something different. Uh, come out next year. So well, you are in a, you are quite the Renaissance man, and I I thank you so much for coming on, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. 
Oh, just when you think you might get that amazing parenting tip that's going to just set everything over the edge, you find out that everything uh, is going to require patience and time. Hey, I tried, but even one of the best economists in the world needed patience and time with his kids. Hilarious stories. Thank you again to Dr. Gans for coming on. What a tremendous guest. Please check out his website, Joshua, J-O-S-H-U-A, Gans, G-A-N-S dot com. Has all of his writing, his books, multiple blogs. He's extremely prolific and another example of someone who is, as they said in Alexander Hamilton, he is nonstop. He is relentless and he is a fantastic human being. I thank him so much for his time. Please check out all of his work. If you enjoy this, I have many other episodes. Please check out Vern Goes Against the Grain podcast. It's on YouTube. It's on whatever you listen to now. I've interviewed some amazing individuals. And I think there's always something to be learned from listening to someone with a great story like Dr. Joshua Gans. Also, if you like this a lot, accepting tips on Anchor, just go to the website, find Vern Goes Against the Grain. Anything is appreciated. I always want to upgrade the technology, keep trying to bring you guests, anything I can to make your life better. Please help me help you. I also wrote a book, 10 Scientifically Proven Ways Steve Jobs Went Against the Grain, available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Thank you again. Thank you again to Dr. Gans, and I will talk to you all later.